during that whole three or four day experience was the time that I spent with a lot of my non-Catholic brothers and sisters in Christ touring St. Peter's or just walking around the Vatican or even taking a, you know, taking a trip down the streets of Rome. It was interesting, there was one man in particular, I won't mention his name, he's very high up in a certain Southern Baptist convention. And the beginning of the week, he was, he was sharply antagonistic, especially when he found out that I was not only a Catholic, but a convert from Evangelical Bible Christianity. It didn't help that my father-in-law was the head of the group. He went after me. And I'm German enough to go right back after him. And so we had a ball for about three and a half hours the very first night. And he made it very clear to me that this was tantamount to apostasy. And I began to watch his, his, his whole attitude change in the next two or three days. He made no bones about it. The Pope was pretentious. The Pope was really wrong in claiming to be the inf infallible vicar of Christ. But as we toured through St. Peter's together, you could hear his own hushed awe as he saw these gorgeous mosaics, the sculptures, the architecture. And I kept chiding him with a certain gentle persistence. <laughs> Where has Protestantism produced this sort of architecture, this sort of art? And he admitted that there's nothing to compare. A good friend of mine who wasn't able to go along a fellow by the name of Richard White, who's finishing a doctoral program in Catholic theology, a uh, former student of mine. Uh, I, I talked to him about all of this just a few weeks after I got back from Rome. And he told me of his experience. After I converted, he wanted to have nothing to do with me. And then one day he had to go up to a library in Chicago to pull a few books out of Mundelein Seminary Library. And he just looked around Mundelein Seminary and he said, there's nothing that I've ever seen in Protestantism to compare to the art and to the architecture, and that could not even compare to St. Peter's or anything in the Vatican. There is a real exter external splendor about the church one witnesses in Rome. The Catholic faith has the power to produce civilization, not just denominations. It's gorgeous. I remember the last few hours of that day as we were preparing to meet Pope John Paul II, I wasn't sure exactly what would, what would happen as all these non-Catholic leaders, these denominational heads, were preparing for this private audience. The meeting that took place an hour before our audience was most interesting. The first thing that happened was the Salvation Army representative stood up and said, this man whom we're about to meet is a man of God, a man of the gospel, a man of Christ, and I see Christ in his eyes. And so as we go before him and present our burden, let's pray that the Lord will use this man who he's anointed. I thought, wow, this guy's going to get in trouble, you know, it gets out. And all of a sudden I saw the Southern Baptist leader stirring. I thought, well, point, counterpoint, you know. And he arose and he said, I want to take it a step further. When you hear this man speak, you hear the gospel proclaimed. Around the world, not since St. Paul has there been an evangelist, been heard by so many people. He has the moral courage and the integrity. And the, these halls throughout the Vatican, we can just see how this living faith can, can move and stir the hearts of many people. I want to pray that we can go and have him do, for the problem of pornography, what he's done to communism in Eastern Europe. And all of a sudden, I saw this woman getting ready to stand up, and, and, and she was a representative of the National Council of Churches and the World Council of Churches also in Switzerland, which is a very liberal body of Protestant denominations. She has her doctorate from Harvard. She's taught theology at Harvard. She's no small figure. She has considerable clout and stature. And she's also a very strident feminist in a sort of way. And so when she stood up, I thought, well, now certainly we're going to hear the balance. And she said, I want to take it one step further. She said, this man, more than any thousand men you'll find, is responsible for tearing down the Iron Curtain and bringing liberty to millions of Eastern Europeans. This man not only lives the gospel, he understands the needs of humans around the world. And as we present to him the problem of hardcore pornography, I expect him to take action and make a world of difference. 
Bernadine and I began looking at each other. We were winking. We're like, you know, if only Catholics could hear this. It was an unbelievable experience for 15 or 20 minutes listening to the testimony of people who had toured Rome, who had gone through the Vatican, who are now going to walk through St. Peter's en route to meeting His Holiness. And then after the meeting, we all came back. They were talking about Pope John Paul II. They were talking about the halls and the rooms. It was an unbelievable experience. I pray that everybody would have an opportunity at some point to make a pilgrimage to Rome to see Mother Church in this sort of external splendor. There's no question about it. It can impress the most antagonistic anti-Catholic, as it impressed me. But it's not enough just to show off your artistic and aesthetic beauty. There has to be something more. A second type of external splendor that I'd like to reflect upon with you is the liturgy and the worship of the Roman Catholic Church. Where I come from, in Bible Christian circles, most worship services are very sermon-centered and most churches are very pastor-centered. In fact, it's very easy to see personality cults arise in certain churches where orators, where great rhetoricians are preaching 30, 40, 50 minutes each Sunday. And people come and really measure their experience on the basis of how motivated and how informed and excited they feel at the end of the sermon. And it's a shame because I think all of them, like I was, all of them are aware that something very man-centered is happening. Now, I don't, want to, I don't want to downplay the importance of the homily. I would long to see the day where your average Catholic parishioner would say, oh, please, more than 20 minutes. How about 30 minutes? How about 40 minutes? More scripture, please, make it come alive, you know. That'd be glorious. But even if we achieve that in our lifetimes, something more needs to remain at the center, and that is the Liturgy of the Eucharist, where the holy sacrifice of the Mass is celebrated with reverence and with a certain sacred awe that America is losing rapidly. And so, even when I was antagonistic towards the Catholic Church, I would pick up books by Louis Bouillet or Henri de Lubac, where they would describe the liturgy. And I knew the Old Testament pretty well. I knew it well enough to recognize the fact that there were incredible ritual parallels between what the priests of the Old Testament did and the priests of the Catholic Church. What was involved in the Levitical sacrifices and the language used to describe it.